lifestyle of rich and famous, being a, you know rich, being popular, having a bling bling, and they're not even looking for God, as Job said. Their thing is, who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What profit do we have if we pray to him? We're already walking in wealth. We're already walking in prosperity. What do I need God for? And so the church is now taking on that same mindset to where they don't want God's presence. So now you're starting to see more people in the pew that may have more money, but there's more sickness in the sanctuary. Yes. Now you're starting to see people sitting in the pews where they may have better jobs, they may be having a more economic investment portfolio, but now you have more generational curses run through their family. Or now you start seeing more manifestations of demonic operations in the church. You know, now you start seeing where a person feels comfortable walking up in a church with a gun and shoot people in the, in the seats. Why? Because the presence of God is no longer in the sanctuary. Mm. Why? Because now, instead of the presence of God being in the sanctuary, mammon is setting up his throne in the sanctuary. Yes. Right. Because people want wealth. People want prosperity. People want riches. They don't want God's presence. They don't want, they don't identify the fact that the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They don't right. understand that the Bible says that he shall supply your needs according to his riches. It's not enough for him to have a thousand cattle on the hill. It does, it's, not, it's not enough for that. They want the riches. They want the prosperity. They want the wealth, but they don't want God. And so what ultimately happens is because they don't want God, God ends up give, turning them over to the gods that they want. And so because you don't want him, he turns you over to man. And then what happens when he turns you over to mammon, you may begin to prosper a little bit for just a season because mammon wants to make sure he embraces you and brings you in just enough. Right. It's almost as if when you first start dating somebody and you feel like this is the perfect cat. They, get, they know how to talk. They know how to sweet talk you. They know how to be affectionate. They always make time for you. But then once they've been with you a little while, now they start to separate themselves. Now you smother in them. Now they no longer want to affiliate with you. <laughs> Why? Because they know how to, to present themselves to you to pull you in. Now that they instead you, they no longer want to deal with you. Mm -hmm. What happens with mammon is he gives you just enough to keep you real and keep you bowing down to him to where ultimately he has you so instead to where what happens as a result of you bowing down to mammon is now you have sickness, you have afflictions, you have death all over, you know, your family, run through your family, run through your house. You have, you know, generational curses manifesting. Now you start having all type of demonic operations and manifestations breaking out in your family. You're trying to find out what the source of it is. And the reality is because you turned your back on the living God to go after mammon, the, the living God turns you over, but he's also going to let mammon consume your riches. Yes. Because what Mammon is going to do, Mammon is going to make sure he gives you just enough to keep you coming, but then he's also going to make sure that he begins to take it back because if he gives you too much, then you no longer going to need Mammon. Oh, you didn't hear. <laughs> if, if Mammon gives you too much, if Mammon allows you to prosper too much, then at some point you're going to get comfortable with your wealth. To where at that point, no longer are you going to bow down to the living God, but you're also going to feel like you're not going to need Mammon anymore either. Because now you have a certain comf comfortability level with your wealth and your riches and you're living a nice, comfortable lifestyle. So now you no longer are you willing to jump through hoops to get riches. Why? Because you got some now. Hmm. No longer are you willing to deal with all the strings that come along with prosperity. Why? Because you got a little bit now. So now you no longer need that. So what Mammon says, I'm going to give you just enough. I'm going to keep you on this little fishing line. And then as you begin to get comfortable, you begin to fall for the bank. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a sickness on you. I'm going to get with my brothers, my demonic principalities that I run with, my demonic principalities that bow down to me like pride and greed and different <laughs> ones that bow down to me as mammy. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get with them and I'm going to have them put an affliction on you. To where now, even though you have money, now because you're sick, you're constantly going to the hospital, so it's eating through your money. So it's that gonna keep you for me because you're always gonna need more money because you have this terminal illness now. Now you have a cancer to where you have to have a certain level of money or good insurance in order to stay alive, so you think, because I deceived you into thinking that the doctors is the answer. And so what <laughs> happens is I I have given it to you, but then I take it back from you. To keep you before me. That's right. And so that part. So what happens is you get comfortable, but then right at the point that you feel like you're comfortable, now here comes a sickness. Now here comes cancer. Now you're constantly going back and forth to the hospital, and you're trying to find out what's going on. 
when I didn't have nothing, I was healthy. Now I got a little bit of something, now I'm constantly going to the hospital. When I didn't have nothing, I was okay, I was struggling, but I was healthy. Now I got a little bit of something, now the doctors tell me I got diabetes. I, I, my diet hasn't changed. I'm eating the same thing I always eat, but now the, the diagnosis of the doctor is different. So once upon a time when I didn't have nothing, I was praying, I was laying out before God, and I was struggling, I didn't really have what people thought was significant. But I had the power of the living God operating on the inside of me that kept me healthy because I stayed within his presence. But now that I have a little bit of riches, a little bit of wealth, I feel like I no longer need him. So I turn my back on him to pursue further riches and further wealth. And so what mammon does is says, okay, you want riches? You want wealth? I give it to you. <laughs> Serve me, I give it to you. So, uh, and the way this translates is, no, most people are not bowing down to a physical demon called mammon, praying, asking mammon to bless them. That part. Most people are not doing that. What happens is, most people that get tied up with mammon is when they're supposed to be serving God, Something comes up to where they have to go to work. You were supposed to be on the hospitality committee, but your job called you at the last minute. That part. You were supposed to head the usher board meeting, but at the last minute, your family is getting together. And so now, you're, because your family's having to get together, the usher board meeting is now taking second seat. That's part of the Or... You were supposed to give so much to the church, but because your homegirls and your homeboys is going to the casino boat, that part, you can no longer give what you start to give to the church because you want to make sure that you have enough to go to the casino boat when they go. And so what happens is we turn our backs on the living God to serve man and go after wealth and go after riches. And then what mammon does is he says, okay, now that you have a little bit of something, I want it back. Right. I'm going to let you taste it, but I want it back. So he basically treats you like an ass. People are literally addicted to money. People are addicted to money. Most times when you talk to somebody and you're talking about addiction, they think about sex, they think about uh, uh, drugs, cocaine, crack, heroin. They think about all that type of stuff. But there's people that's addicted to money. They would do anything for money. They will kill you for money. They will slit your throat for money. They will rob you for money. They will become your right, friend right. if they think you're going to give them some money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is because we get ensnared and the church has become ensnared to the fact that we're, we're more focused on money and riches, that we no longer want the presence of God. We want the money and the material things. Mm -hmm. And so because we want the money and the materialism and no longer wants God's presence, now you have better jobs. Now you have more income, but now you don't have God's favor. Now you don't have God's grace. Now you don't have God's uh, protection. And so what happens is when you really didn't have what you thought you needed, you could live in the worst neighborhood possible and not have to worry about nobody breaking into your house. That's Why? right. Because God watched over you. Right. Now you have a little bit of something. Now you're concerned you don't want to leave your house because you don't know if some people from your old days right. know where you live. Right. So now you don't want to leave your house because you don't have that security of knowing that God is still watching over you. Right. And so ultimately what happens is because we're chasing money and we're no longer chasing God's presence is that the money has become the God. Mm. Money has become our God to where now money is more significant. Right. The Bible says choose you this day. Mm. Now the problem is not money. Problem's not money. The Bible says money solves all things. The love of money is the root of all evil. So the problem's not money. The problem is our mindset towards money. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we want to bow down to money, to where we want to serve money, and we don't want mm -hmm. to serve God with our money. Like, right. we get our money, but right. we don't want to serve God and worship the Lord with our money. Mm -hmm. We want our money, but we don't want to worship the Lord and acknowledge he, that he's the God that gave us the substance. Right. We want to protect our money. We want to hold on to our money. But the Bible says money solves all things. So the problem is not money. We're in Job 21 and Psalm 37. But the problem is not money. The problem is our mindset towards money. Hmm. When we get a little bit of money, 
we hold on to. We don't want to worship the Lord. We, hmm. we walk past people. We walk past people that may be in a serious need. And because we only have a few dollars in our pocket, we'd be like, I ain't got it. And so now there's two deceptions there. One is, and we're, we're, more, we're doing more teaching this week than preaching. I may have to finish this next week. But one, one problem with that statement is, first of all, that person there genuinely had a need. So I ain't got it. We have a couple issues. One is we judge them. We're trying to determine what they're going to do with the money when I give it to mm-hmm. them. Right. Yes. So That's we're judging them. The next thing is, we're lying. Mm -hmm. Because we're saying, I don't have it. But we do have it. It may be Mm -hmm. close to all we have. But we do have it. We may want to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. But at that time, we do have it. If we had $5 in our pocket and somebody said, can you help me with some change? Like, I may not have no change. But if they got a cup with some change in their cup, I can pull out my five and be like, give me $4.50. You just asked for some change. (laughs) Or I can bless you with the entire five, knowing that the God I serve is going to take care of me. Mm -hmm. So I lie and say I don't have it when I really do. Mm -hmm. The problem with lying about not having it is now I'm confessing the fact that I don't have it. All right. Right. So I'm never going to have it because I'm constantly confessing the fact that I don't have it. Every time somebody asks me, I don't have it. I don't say no. I say I don't have it. The Bible says you will have what you say. So if I'm saying I don't have it, then I'm never going to have it because that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying no. I'm not saying I have it, but not for you. I'm not saying not today. I'm saying I don't have it. And so when I make a consistent effort, and and it's a consistent everyday occurrence to where I'm saying I don't have it, what ultimately happens is I never have it, Mm -hmm. not because God can't give it to me, but because I'm saying I don't have it. Right. 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 And so what happens is, because of our confession, we don't get blessed. Because people who we think are, are just running game, or people who we think is just gamers, or people who we think is just trying to get what we have, we judge them, and then we get caught into the deception of lying, saying, I don't have it. And the enemy is content with us saying we don't have it because he understands that we're going to have what we say. Right. So if we continue to say we don't have it, then we're not going to have it. Yes. So what happens is we need to change what we're saying. Yes, sir. The only way you can change what you're saying is if you do what the Lord said when he said, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Mm. The only reason why you're lying about what you have in your pocket is because you're concerned about this evildoer. Mm. You're judging this evildoer whether or not they're going to run off and get some alcohol, mm-hmm. whether they're going to go get some drugs. They may be an angel of the Lord dispatched to bless you. That's all right. All they're trying to do is right. test you and see if you're going to release it. Right. And if you release it, then the blessing can come. But if you don't release it, then you prolong your affliction. Mm. That's why the Bible says, be careful how you entertain strangers. strangers. Because right. some have entertained angels unaware. We think of angels flying around with wings. Mm-hmm. But if but if an angel looked like that, we would be able to recognize it. Right. And yep. so we... He wouldn't have to say, be careful how you entertain strangers if we would be able to recognize an angel when they showed up. And so what happens is we begin to deceive ourselves into believing that we're better than that person asking us for what they're asking for. Right. We may be in the same situation, but we believe we're better than them at that moment. So we judge them. Oh, they just going to go out and get some alcohol. They just going to go out and get some drugs. Right, what about the right, time when right. you didn't have food in your refrigerator and you asked your cousin for $20? Would you go and right. get some drugs? Right, right. What about the time when you got the disconnect notice on your utilities and you caught your mama and she paid your bill for you? Hmm. Was you going to the strip club? Was you going to get a drink? Or did you really have a need? Right. That part. Yeah. So right. we consider ourselves to be better than somebody that we see in that state to where we judge them and automatically assume they're going to do the wrong thing. Right. And what happens is our spirit is speaking because our spirit says, if that was me, this is what I'd be doing. Mm-hmm. If I was in their situation, I'd go take that money, and I wouldn't worry about getting off the street. Right. I'd go get me something to drink. Right. The spirit speak. 
The Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. So if I'm pure in my mindset and I'm pure in my spirit and I'm walking upright before the Lord and pureness and righteousness, I'm not going to be concerned with what you're going to do. That's right. Right. Negativity is not even going to cross my mind mm -hmm. because my thoughts are pure. I'm not judging you. Mm -hmm. But my spirit speaks when I judge you and say, oh, they're just going to go out and get some drugs. My spirit speaks. What I'm saying is, my spirit is saying that if I was in that situation, I may not go get no drugs, right. but it's something else I would do with the money. Mm -hmm. Right. Then what I'm telling people I'm, I'm going to do with it. the money. Right, right, right. I may not go to a strip club or may not try to find, you know, a, a prostitute, but mm -hmm. I may not do what I'm going to say with the money. Right. And so how many times is it that you told your cousin that you needed twenty dollars to get some food, but you actually went and got a sack? Okay, I ain't gonna get no help. Oh. <laughs> I ain't I ain't gonna oh, get wow. I ain't gonna get no help. <laughs> okay. Or how many times did you tell your, your parents that you needed help with the utility bill, but the only reason why you needed help with the utility bill is because you partied up the whole weekend? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. or, 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 or or worse, mm -hmm. you was a female and you had a date, and you covered the tab. Mm. Oh, mm. that's a no-no. And so now your bills are short because you covered the tab for somebody who was supposed to be interested in you. So if they're supposed to be interested in you, why are you treated? Okay, that's a topic for a different day. But if they're really interested in you, why are you coming out of your pocket to treat? Mm. If they're approaching you, asking you, hey, Ma, uh, can we talk? Hey, Ma, can we go out? Hey, Ma, what's up with you? Can I holler at you? Then why are you going to your pocket? That part. Treat me. Hmm. If they're supposed to be interested in you, right. why are you treated? Why are you going to your pocket? And they're supposed to have interest in you. If anything, you should cover your own. Let them cover theirs. Right. Because you don't want to give them power over you either. So you don't want them treating you and you're not in that position to where it's going to go somewhere. That's what I mean right. That is, it's not in a position to where it's going to turn out into what God ordained as far as marriage. That part. It, that it's just going to be a prolonged one night stand that took six months. You thought it was going to lead to the altar, but it led you to the altar, but you was by yourself crying out to the Lord because your heart got broke. Mm -hmm. And so if someone's interested in you, then you should take care of your tag. Let them take care of their tab. That way they don't have power over you. But at the same time, you should not be treating them and they're supposed to be interested in you. Now, the thing is, and, and I know people think I got off topic, but I haven't. I really haven't. If you look at, if you look at verse 16, it says, Indeed, the prosperity is not in their hand. I'm in, back in Job 21. It says, Indeed, the prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from it. And so basically, what I'm telling you is, you need to quit listening to people that's trying to tell you how to get a man, or trying to tell you how to get a woman, and they don't have a wife, or they don't have a husband. That's the counsel of the wicked. The counsel of the wicked is far from me, is what Job is saying. That's how he was able to consider righteous and upright, because he didn't associate with unrighteous people. He didn't put himself in a position to get feedback from people that weren't just or didn't have God in their life that's or right. trying to satisfy or please the Lord. And so that's why he's able to say the counsel of the wicked is far from me. That's why Psalm says, blessed is the man that sit not in the counsel of the ungodly. Because what happens is you begin to sit in the counsel of the ungodly and they begin to release curses over you. You think they're just giving you advice and feedback, but they're 